get us started. Galatians chapter 5. Today we get to wrap up this little series within a series and uh, conclude the fruit of the Spirit with the ninth, which is temperance. And uh, something we probably need to examine in ourselves in this new year. Um, I don't know, I can't speak for you, I can speak for myself that um, you know, I can lack temperance from time to time. Kind of go a little to this way or a little to that way. And, and so that's what we're going to be discussing here this morning. And um, I, I really believe that the Lord wants balanced lives, He wants balanced doctrine. Uh, balanced witnessing, balance in all aspects of our lives, but when it comes to temperance, there's something that he wants us to be, um, I don't want to say dead in the middle, but a little off to the right. And I'll explain what that means as we get there. Let's go ahead and read the text. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, as always, starting in verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Can I get a witness? Yeah. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Can I get a witness there? Yeah, we see them. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And if you are a saved, born again child of God, trusting in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, then that which does such things is your flesh, and not your soul and your spirit. Your flesh shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You will get a new, incorruptible, undefiled inheritance that fadeth not away. It's reserved in heaven for you. And at that trump, boom, you're going to put on incorruption. And then you'll be able to walk in heaven. Hallelujah. And then see Jesus. Hallelujah. I, I can't wait to see Jesus, but I'll tell you what. I hope that when that trumpet blasts, I'm doing something I ought to be doing. Amen. That's the only thing that makes me nervous. I don't know about you. What will you be doing when the trump blasts? What will your attitude be? Will you be in the middle of getting angry and screaming at somebody? Honking your horn at somebody that cut you off? God forbid a middle finger flying when you got angry. Come on, I mean, we're human and flesh. And let it not be so named among us, but if and when it does, please let it not be when that trumpet sounds long. Amen. All right, so let's pray and then we'll get to business. Father, I uh, just want to thank you uh, for getting the people here that you got here this morning, for getting us up out of bed. Um, I pray now, Lord God, that we would be motivated, moved, excited by the Scripture this morning. Um, that... Um, not only would be, we be moved and excited about the Scripture, but that the Scripture itself after would move us unto good works and, and uh, as is the message this morning, unto temperance. Um, and uh, Holy Spirit of God, we just commit the text of Scripture to you and ask that you would teach it this morning, move in and among the people here, speak to them individually, knock on the door of their hearts, address them as they need to be addressed, and uh, all to the praise of your glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's start out as boring as I typically start out by giving you some word etymology. Y'all love word etymology as much as I do, right? Exciting! Temperance. Appears in your Bible uh, three times. It's not a whole lot. You think it would be. It also appears uh, one other time in the form of the word temper. The principle behind the word is all over the Bible, though. You know, um, and without the right temperament, you will never be meek. 
So the last fruit of the Spirit works in accord with this fruit of the Spirit. You know, they kind of all work together and help build the other, almost progressively, but not necessarily progressively. So uh, let's talk a little bit about this word. The word temperance, it has a mid-13th century beginning. I know that all gets you excited and you know has its roots in Anglo-French and Latin, and that gets you all excited. I don't know why I like that stuff. I just do. But I'll tell you what, you know what you never, or I can't say never, but what you rarely hear me say? The Hebrew, the Greek, because he gave me an English Bible. So what do I do? I look up the English word and find out why the Lord chose that particular word. And, and, he, and there's some neat things when you find what the roots are and where they came from and how it moved all across Europe. I should go from this way for you guys. All across Europe and over into England. And then God created this perfect English language, had the Bible penned down, and then the British Empire brought it into all the world. So pretty neat stuff. To me, it's neat. So the general meaning of the word is to moderate. That's what temperance means. It means to moderate. To help us along in our understanding and the depth of the meaning, let's consider um, a word uh, that gets its root from the word temper, and that's temperature. We got some cold ones. This week's been brutal. Very, very brutal. But let's be honest now. If you want a nice, if you're like me, anyone like steak? Yeah. A few of you. I love steak. Good ribeye, you know, lots of fat, unfortunately. Love good, good steak. If you want a juicy piece of steak, you must not cook the meat at too high of a temperature for too long of a time. You know, usually your slow roasts. Well, we got a chef in here, right? Okay, tender meat, right? Um, if you want to enjoy a good piece of beef, you can't um, not cook it, you know, or cook it at a too low of a temperature for too short of a time. Right? Because it won't get done and you won't be able to enjoy it. it. You want the right temperature, you want the right timing. And that's what temperament, temperament and temperance and temperature is all about. You want a well prepared meal that will not be too hot, too cold, or lukewarm when you pull it out of the oven. And believe it or not, I am not attempting to do a Goldilocks and the Three Bears kind of sermon this morning. It's just kind of heading in that direction. At Bible Believers, as, as your pastor and hopefully you folks, um, without using the word in um, a negative way, we kind of pride ourselves in uh, finding a balance in the scripture. As a pastor, I've always tried to teach balance because I've watched throughout the years, I wrote a whole book on it, you know, pastors going too far left, going too far right, and therefore leading a congregation too far left or too far right. And I don't want to do that. I believe God wants a balance, and so I've been uh, pretty adamant about making sure that there's a balance. Don't jump too far right. Don't jump too far left. Don't base your uh, doctrine, your mannerism, on the uh, knee-jerk reaction of watching other people. For example, someone's out there witnessing for Jesus Christ on a street corner, and their sign reads, God hates fags. If you don't think that happens, you're wrong. It does. All the time. Um, so, what is a knee-jerk reaction to that? Well, we should never do, we should never preach on a street corner. That's the knee-jerk. That's going too far the other way. No, what you shouldn't do is preach what they're preaching, but you should still preach. So, but we kind of have this unbalanced approach a lot of the time. I know I've had it. Has anyone else had it? I'm not the only one. Right? I've been, uh, you know, a lib what people have considered a liberal Christian and everybody in the church thought, when we were at First Bible years ago, I think Wendy and I were considered probably two of the most liberal Christians. We came out of the charismatic movement. How could it not be part of who we were at a point? Uh, and then we got balanced by the Word of God, and then we watched um, a, a pastor fall, and I, for one, became kind of staunch and um, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, hard and um, standards-driven, and you know, with dress and with holidays and all this stuff, and and um, 
and I think I got a little out of balance with that as well. Um, that's just... Now, I, what I hear through the grapevine is that that guy, you know, he's too liberal from one mouth. And then the next I hear, boy, that guy, he's too conservative from the next mouth. And now I know I'm doing things right. <laughs> Seriously, because, I mean, you're, as long as you're preaching the Word of God, somebody's going to find fault with you. But if half of them are saying I'm liberal, liberal and half of them are saying I'm conservative, I think we're doing something right. That's just, that's my approach to things. Amen? Alright. So, when it comes to our approach and this whole balance thing, my approach... Uh, wanting to be right in that middle spot. It works for everything. It does not work for temperance. So, that said, Revelation chapter 3. Let me show you. Temperance, temperament, temperature. When it comes to that, the Lord is going to... He has a preference. A twofold preference, though one is preferred above the other. And then one is despised. Revelation 3, verses 14 through 16, speaking to... By the way, the church that exemplifies this last day's church. Hopefully not this church, but the church of this generation. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. How's that? That's Jesus speaking. And he's talking to this generation. Yes, he was talking to a church back then, but he's, oh, he's talking to this generation. And he's saying, here are your options. Hot, cold, and lukewarm. And if you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you. Well, that's kind of right in the middle, right? Say, well, okay, well, what about the hot and the cold? Uh, he prefers the hot. Do you know why he's saying, I would that thou wert hot or cold? Because the lukewarm is so despicable to him. These people that just kind of, they feign, I'm excited about the Lord, and then sit in their pews and do nothing. At least if you're cold... He knows where you stand. Other people know where you stand. So what he, what he desires is hot. Burning. Not too hot. And we're, we'll explain all that. Cold is good because at least, you know, and if, if, let's go back to the meat illustration. Some, some meat gets served cold, right? Was it steak tartare? Is that cold? All right. Keep looking to the chef over there. You know, uh, I, I would not never eat it, uh, but some people like that stuff. Hot is good. Usual preference for meat. What it can't be is too hot, right? I still got a burn mark from, I had pork chop last night, and I took a bite, and it was too hot. You, know, burn, you ever burn the roof of your mouth? Yeah, we had uh, Megan and Ethan over, and I didn't tell you at the time, but I was like, mm, you know, as I took the first bite. I didn't say anything, but uh, now you know. It's a little burn up here. The meat was too hot. Um, so if I want to enjoy it, what do you got to do? Well, you let it sit there for a minute, right? Let it uh, temper itself. Um, so you, you can't work with too hot because it can burn you. You can't work with too cold because, you know, to touch it, it hurts. Anyone, you know anyone that's too cold out there? Getting too close to them isn't comfortable. <laughs> Getting a cold shoulder, getting cold speech, cold attitude, bitterness, bitter. Like you say bitter cold, well there's bitterness of spirit, same thing. Always grumpy, always upset, always miserable, always unhappy, no matter what happens. You won the lottery! 
Yeah. And then, you know, some snide comment comes out after it, you know. But someone with uh, a poor temp temperament is someone who would be out of control hot, burning everything he touches, or someone who's out of control cold, freezing everything he touches. Can't, can't be either one. I'll, uh, uh, actually, water is a good illustration. Um, back in the day uh, when that church in particular, the Laodicean church, was uh, the real Laodicean church, the historical one, um, they had uh, water ducks that would go through the, throughout the city and it would come from fresh springs and the springs would be very cold and, and then um, uh, as uh, they moved on down through and came to the reservoir where people would drink from uh, in Laodicea, it would be um, warm, lukewarm by the time it would get there. Anyone has ever had a glass of water? What, how do we drink water? Cold or hot? You know, teas and such. You leave a glass out for about six hours and it's, it doesn't even taste different. You know, it just doesn't taste good. Well, that's kind of what happens to people. You know, they, they run a certain temperature for a certain amount of time and then time is the great, they say time's like the great equalizer. Time without continually stoking flames, time can be a real great hindrance to a Christian walk. And you, you, uh, you think about this. How many times have you been burning hot for the Lord and excited, and then six months later you go, "What happened? Amen. Where did? How did I, I? You know, I don't even want to come to church this morning. What happened? I was excited just a few months ago. It's just time because life." happens. And life's always not so fun, right? So you said, Pastor, you've talked about beef, you're talking about water. What is going on? I don't understand. What am I supposed to be? Well, not lukewarm. Uh, not cold. Be hot. Not too hot. You're not supposed to burn people. But be hot. Well, let me bring you to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Great section of verses here. I, I refer to them so often that I probably, if we ever start teaching the second letter of Peter that uh, I, I probably won't just be able to cross over it quickly because uh, so often referring to it. But Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. You know, that's a reference to the Scripture. Everything you need for this life to be godly in it, it's given you in the Bible. That's, what, you know, in part why I chose to sing the Bible stands this morning. Um, Through the knowledge of Him that, caused, that called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And, and you will escape that corruption. We talked about that fleshly corruption. You're going to be putting on the divine nature. You will have a body like Jesus has a body. It will be sinless like Jesus is sinless. We can't wrap our minds around that right now. But it, it's going to happen if you've trusted Jesus, if He's your Savior. You've got a great future. Amen. Now, and beside this, everything I've just talked about, giving all diligence. So, come on. Pay attention here. Um, add to your faith. That's where everything started for you. Faith in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Add to your faith virtue. And to virtue knowledge and to knowledge what's that word temperance 
temperance. Now, everything, of course, begins with faith. Jesus, you know, he said uh, to a number of people, and we talked about it when we covered uh, faith, but he said, receive thy sight, thy faith hath saved thee. You know, everything um, that begins in Christianity begins with faith in the Word of God and the Jesus Christ who wrote it. Right? That's where, that's where everything starts. For by grace are ye saved through faith. faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So faith saves. Faith gives sight where uh, sight once did not exist. Faith brings light to an, other, uh, an otherwise dark area. Uh, and it is the victory that overcometh the world. Amen? 1 John 5, 4. So faith saves. Faith gives victory. Faith pleases God. Without it, it's impossible to please Him. But faith does not settle a man. Faith creates zeal. Faith can burn extremely hot. There are those out in this world who would say that they have extreme faith in a God who would ask them to strap a bomb to their chest and blow up children. That faith created great zeal, but that zeal was not good. These, by the way, are not Christians. But Christians can burn hot and out of control as well. And I've watched it happen. I've been that burning flame, quite frankly, at times myself. So God says that we are to add, of course, virtue, but to faith, also knowledge. You know, there's a saying out in that world, uh, knowledge empowers. And uh, it's, a, it's a all right catchphrase. I would say it's got some, uh, it might be one of those worldly catchphrases that has a Bible base. Knowledge, biblically speaking, is the result, the first result of a fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. It's Proverbs 1 and verse 7. So, knowledge is a good thing, right? It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's something that's to be added to our faith. And it can help temper or what I would refer to as mature us. but it can also turn too cold. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Anyone know here people that, or maybe, you know, maybe you can refer to yourself, but anyone know somebody who knows lots and lots and lots about the Bible and is miserable? One and me, so two people. Joe, we check pulse pulses. We just those. first Corinthians. And maybe I'm losing you. I don't know. A little more prayer time in the morning to get things going here. First Corinthians chapter eight, verse one. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge. What does it do? Puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Now, if you think edifying is a lifting up, but there's a difference between lifting up and puffing up. Yeah. Knowledge can, you know, there are people out there. You know, I've heard, I've heard people talk about other other saved people in churches, prayer requests. Uh, you know, uh, keep someone. Uh, in prayer, you know, they got one of those uh, stupid NIV Bibles and they're really dumb and they don't, they're Christians but they're, they're just wishy-washy and okay, so because you have the King James Bible, which is the Word of God you're going to now call them dumb? Was there ever a time you didn't have a King James Bible? Should we call you dumb? Was there ever a time you didn't know who Jesus Christ was? Should we call that person dumb? No. The answer is no. Knowledge puffeth up. Some of the most knowledgeable men are also some, some of the coldest men that I've ever run into. Faith 
can burn too hot and hurt others. Knowledge can freeze too cold and likewise hurt others. So God says, let me now, I want you to have knowledge. I want you to have faith. I want you to have virtue. But you know what? Let's now take temperance. Because now that you got faith, and now that you got knowledge of the Bible, let's calm you down. Let's calm you down. Let's find temperance. Let's balance you out. Balance your faith in Jesus Christ and your knowledge in the Scripture and make you even keeled. God wants faith under control. God wants knowledge and zeal under control. So that third thing becomes temperance, or the fourth thing, I should say, becomes temperance. And all others that follow behind are a display of temperance in one's life. Patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. They're all part of someone and they're progressive. And it shows maturity. Listen, I, again, over and over and over again, I've heard people talk about well, I know this about the Bible. I know this about the Bible. And it becomes, you know, study, study, study. And I'm all for it. Praise the Lord. But then they're not very kind. And they're not charitable. But they think that because they've reached this level of knowledge of the Scripture that they've arrived. No, you've not. Maturity is when you can be kind to other people. When you have charity one towards another, that's when you, you know, patience, godliness, all these things, they progress. And if you can, you know, if you look at these things and you see what you're missing, chances are that once you miss one, you'll start to miss the other and the other and the other after it. Because this here in Peter is very progressive. Brotherly kindness and charity. going to help you keep thinking about other people before thinking about you. Lack of patience, ill-tempered. You know who you're thinking about first? Let me give you a... Um, let me use this as an illustration. This is how I've seen it, seen it played out over the years. Brother so-and-so whoever that may be, he's reading the Bible. Praise the Lord. Got saved. He's now adding uh, virtue and, and, and knowledge of Scripture to his faith. Amen. That's what the Lord wants him to do. By faith, he is reading and receives reproof from the Holy Spirit of God regarding a particular sin in his life. Anyone ever been there before? Reading the Scriptures, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit goes, and thou art the man. Right? Um, and it's in regards to, let's just say, a particular sin that's been in his life for the last five years that maybe he didn't even know was really a sin until the Holy Spirit pointed out to him. But now the Spirit is addressing the matter and it's time for him to make a change. And so the Spirit is pressing heavy upon him. To that faith, brother so-and-so has also uh, the advantage of the knowledge of the Scripture. So now all of a sudden, uh, another verse comes to light. And another verse. And these verses you forgot about are popping in. And the whole, any been, been there? Holy Spirit now bring into remembrance some verses that now are talking about your life. Or he's reading in another chapter and it talks about the same thing. And, and the Holy Spirit will do that. Yeah. You know? And uh, zeal now. He's getting excited. He's getting zeal. The Lord's speaking to me. I need to take care of this. And so zeal becomes the forefront of his, uh, it's at the forefront of his faith and of his knowledge, and it's beginning to burn hot. Well, how hot? Is it too hot? You say, well, preacher, how can faith and knowledge be too hot? Aren't they good things? Yes, they're good things. Um, uh, but they can be bad. You say, how so? Okay, let me just give you an example. Romans 14, flip over there.
Anyone know the subject matter of the chapter of Romans, uh, 14th chapter of Romans? Standards and convictions, personal standards and convictions. It's the whole subject matter. It was fun to teach when we did Romans. Romans 14, verse 22 in particular. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Again, what's the subject matter? Well, in particular, the verse before it about eating meats without being worried about where you bought the meat. You know, because there were people that were worried that that meat was sacrificed to idols and becomes a whole, the whole chapter is about standards and practices and things that I feel are wrong and, and you feel are wrong, but maybe I don't feel are wrong and all that stuff. And he says, hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. So what, what's he talking about? Are we to have the gospel of Jesus Christ to ourself? No, God forbid. Are we to never teach the Bible to other people? Have it to yourself? No, God forbid. Again, this is about personal conviction. Paul says, have it to thyself before God. The man that cannot do that, meaning he's got a particular thing that the Lord has been dealing with him on, it may be a standard. I know of a man who felt he was sinning when he drank Pepsi. I would never look at him and say, that's the stupidest thing in the world. That's not sin. Well, maybe it was to him. And to him it was because he felt he was addicted to it. He was addicted to the sugar. He had it all day long. He'd drink cans and cans and cans. He was getting overweight. So the Lord said, you know what? Cut it out. But he didn't say it to me because I don't have a problem with that. But let's just say... You know, brother so-and-so, we'll, just, we'll say it's the Pepsi man. <laughs> so it's not the Pepsi man, but because he was a good man of God. But regarding the illustration that I brought up, let's just say it took that man five years okay, uh, for the Word of God to speak to him about this predic particular addiction that he had. But once it started happening, uh, you know, he started adding, you know, knowledge to that faith. The scripture started flying. He was reading. He was checking things out. He says, you know what? I can't drink Pepsi before God. I can't in faith drink this. I feel convicted. I need to get it out of my life. Okay? Amen. Now, that person who was afforded five years to get that right, and he's burning so zealous over the matter, and he thinks you drinking Pepsi is wrong. And he's going to give you five seconds to get that right in your life. Yeah. You, ever, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. All right. I, 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 good brothers and sisters in the Lord. If I am tempered with these other godly character traits... I would afford my brothers and sisters in Christ the same amount of time and opportunity for the Spirit to speak to them and move them that He gave me or more. Temperance is controlling yourself. It's not trying to control your brothers and sisters. That's how it burns too hot. And I'm not talking about, please understand, I'm not talking about clear-cut sin. Yeah. That needs to be addressed. And it should be. And, and we should be willing. Listen, if I did something to a fault, if I faulted you, or if I sinned against you and not thinking about it, it's your responsibility, Matthew chapter 18, to come to the offending party and to let them know. So that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about personal conviction and standards that burn too hot. Well, in our family, it's dresses only. Okay, good for you. I'm never going to say you're wrong. Okay, but does your wife now dress? No. <laughs> Well, 
Preacher, let me show you something. What are you, you going to show me? Second Opinions 3.16. A verse out of context that the Lord used to show you something. That's good preaching. That you now want me to see, not by the Spirit of God's moving, but by your Spirit moving in my life. Have it to thyself before God. I want to be happy. I got enough that the Lord deals with me personally. I don't need you adding to it, man. I'm already bogged down. Amen, brother. Don't add a conviction, but like I said, you know, how about edify? Charity. Part of that could be just taking a verse to somebody and instead of beating them down over a pair of slacks, how about an encouraging verse? Amen. That's actually contextual. Amen. All right, listen, and I'm not against dresses. Not for them, I'm not against them. I'm against a man dressing like a woman and a woman dressing like a man. Because that's what the scripture talks about. Now, if I come in with a pink pair of ladies' pants, you best be saying something to me. Amen. And I'll tell you this, if I do, I'm completely insane out of my mind. Something went wrong. Something went loose, okay? Because there was no way I'm walking in. That's the one co I can't manage the, the color pink. I just can't do it. Can't put it on. Can't put a shirt on. Can't do it. Just can't do it. <laughs> my, my sons are the same way. We'll go, you know, if we're in Walmart, we're walking. Of course, they want to go to the toy section, right? And, and just jokingly, I'd be like, how about this aisle? And they see the pink and purple, and they go, that's a girl's aisle! I didn't even teach them that! That just was natural! Just saying, just throwing that out there. Last six and a half, going on seven years here, I don't think... I don't think, and someone correct me if you can remember, in the last six and a half years, have I ever done an altar call? I don't think so. A anyone? Yes, no? I have? I remember one of the house. Do you know why so I do them so rarely if I do them at all? I don't even remember, brother. I'm not saying you're wrong. There's, I can think that there might be a time or two that I would do it, you know. Um, you know why I don't do it? Maybe it's, maybe it's wrong in the other way. Maybe it's a, a, a lack of, like I said, the balance. Maybe it's a knee-jerk reaction to uh, being in a Baptist church for the last however many years. The Baptist, man, they really push that altar call. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pushed. Almost like membership and tithe and water baptism. Those like are the big Baptist pushes and the altar call. you got to come up. Got some Lord speaking to you about something? Come to the altar. What, what is up here? <laughs> is God here? Is He under the table? For of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking. <clears throat> Boy, I just got this desire to tell somebody about Jesus. So where's Jesus? So to me it's always been, well, I can't say it's always been because you know I had that Baptist thing in me and I'd come up to the altar. Um, watch four-year-olds come up to an altar that they didn't even know what they're doing because it's part of the practice of the Baptists. I'm just having some fun right now. Um, but I began to think about this thing and go, boy, that, that preacher, he's trying to be the Holy Spirit. And if he doesn't see enough people at this altar, well, maybe number one, you didn't give the message you thought you were given. Amen. 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 Um, or maybe you have an excellent message prepared and your heart is so 
wickedly obstinate towards the Lord that he's not stirring anybody's heart. Amen. So I began to think, well, you know, these, these preachers doing these altar calls for 10, 15, 20 minutes until they get the whatever appropriate amount of people down here that they could get. And I start hearing these stories about kids uh, faking salvation and going on a rotation, these teens going on a rotation because there would be preachers who would not let the congregation out of the building until someone got saved that week. So the, the teens, being as smart as they are, decided to go on a rotation and get saved each week so that they could go out and have lunch. This is a true story. True story. And preacher didn't care as long as someone got saved. Now, the same person got saved, you know, eight times over the last 12 years. <laughs> well, I, w I wasn't really saved. Now the Spirit's really talking to me. And now I'm re it's a real confession. Why? Just because the preacher wouldn't let people go. You're not the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can't do that. I had some, one time somebody came up to me and goes... Uh, it was at church service and, you know, the, the singing was uh, very manufactured. Uh, you know, lots of glitz and glam, you know, even marching down the front aisle to get to the, 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 the praise team marched down to, I don't know why, needed to be on display apparently. And it so dis detested me, the glory of man on display, that I kind of, you know, I was, I was holding my... Um, uh, newborn nephew in my arms. I remember holding him and just uh, he was sleeping in my arms and uh, a person came up to me and said you know it's not wrong to clap. I said oh I know. You know it's not wrong to sway. I know. Well then why aren't you doing it? I said why are you trying to do what the Holy Spirit is supposed to move in me? And thus began my career of offending people. <laughs> I've, got, I've gotten good over the years. I'm well practiced. All right, go to Ezekiel chapter 46. I want, I want to end with this. I <laughs> got started a lot earlier, I know. But that, that, was, that was bothersome to me. You just put on a big show, you glorified man the whole way through it, and you want me to be excited about what we're singing? This isn't about Jesus. I ain't clapping for you. Amen. Amen. Ezekiel 46, verses 13 and 14. So anyhow, that's why we don't do altar calls, because I, I believe your altar is your heart. Amen. Um, and... I'm not against them. It's one of those things. It's a standard in practice. So when it comes to a standard or a personal thing, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not offended when churches do them. But they get offended when I don't. Okay. Hallelujah. The Lord will work it all out in the end. Ezekiel 46, verses 13 and 14. Take a little something out of context to give you a spiritual lesson. Thou shalt daily prepare a burnt offering unto the Lord of a lamb of the first year without blemish. Thou shalt prepare it every morning. And thou shalt prepare a meat offering for it every morning, the sixth part of an ephah and the third part of a hin of oil, to temper with the fine flour a meat offering continually by a perpetual ordinance unto the Lord. See a couple of things there? You see that word temper in there, right? That's the one time that it appears in Scripture. This is Old Testament law regarding, by the way, because it's in Ezekiel, it's not Genesis through um, uh, Deuteronomy, but it's in regards to the millennial kingdom and the law that will be running it at that time. So I know, I'm aware of the context. But all physical and doctrinal uh, things to be read in the Old Testament are spiritual truths for us to seek out the spiritual application. This lamb is an offering of a body unto the Lord. Right? To be made with flour and oil. The oil, anyone know type of in Scripture? Quite often, not always, but quite often. 
The Holy Spirit of God. How about the flour, which makes bread? A type of the Word of God in the Scripture. So here's the spiritual picture. Go to Romans chapter 12. The Lord expects an offering, Christian, and He expects one from you. And believe it or not, I am now not going to preach the tithe. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Christian, you are the meat offering. You're the lamb. You are the body that is to be offered unto the Lord as a sacrifice, your own sacrifice of your own body. That offering must not be over or undercooked. It is not to be lukewarm. It's not to be cold. It is to be hot. Not burning, but hot. Cooked with oil, the Holy Ghost moving in you and through you as you allow Him to do so by your will. It is to be tempered with flour, the Word of God, as guided by the Holy Spirit and not by your own human spirit. Christian, the Bible, when taught by the Spirit of God, will temper you. When moved by your human spirit, it will over, under, cook, or make you lukewarm. The Bible needs to be read as guided by the Holy Spirit. If it's by your spirit, your ideas, your convictions, your personal desires, you're going to get things messed up. You must walk in the Spirit, back to Galatians, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You want to get things right, you've got to do things by the Holy Spirit of God. You've got to be tempered by oil and flour. God teaching you the Scripture. He can't do it if you don't open it. And if you're going to bring your standards and convictions to it, I'm telling you right now, been there myself. It will trump what the Holy Spirit is trying to show you. You need to be, not mind open, ohm, but you need to be willing. How about we get down on our knees before we read and we say, Holy Spirit of God, show me something. Teach me out of thy law. Show me wondrous things out of thy law. He will. Wondrous things. So that's, anyhow, a lesson on temperance. We need to end with verse 23, though, because it says, against such there is no law. And I've mentioned this a number of times, so just very quickly mention it again. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That is what is referred to as the Law of Moses. There is, of course, more to be found in the prophets, including what we read in Ezekiel, uh, though for the millennium. But there is absolutely nothing in the Law of the Lord that can speak against or condemn the exercise of any of these nine fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's what's going to make you spiritual. Knowledge isn't in there. Standards aren't in there. It begins with love. It's fun. Out on a street corner one time, preaching Jesus best I know how. Is it perfect? No. And 
saw another brother out there. He was preaching at the time. He just finished up. He took a breath. I said, I'm going to go walk over there and encourage him. And I did so. I said, good preaching, brother. Thank you. Something of that nature. And he looked at me like, who are you? Looked at my sign. My sign was John 3.16. And it quoted the verse. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He looked down at that sign, looked back up at me and went, Oh, you're one of those guys all about the love. And then railed on me for the next five minutes. And Pastor Bredo was with me. We were out in Rochester. And Pastor Bredo grabbed me by the shoulder and he just tugged me along and said, Come on. You're going to have trouble with that guy. So I've had trouble with him for years. And I looked. We were at, we were at a, a gay pride parade. Not preaching, I wasn't preaching against homosexuality. I was preaching against sin and the need for a Savior, Jesus Christ. And I remember that day, I'm looking at people, I'm looking at the Christians on the sideline because there was a lot of them there. And a lot of them fighting. And then I looked at a couple of homosexuals holding their hands as they walked down the street. And I went, what is wrong with this picture? Mm -hmm. This guy's screaming at me that I've got a scripture verse about the love of God for mankind and giving his son. And I got yelled at for it. I said, the queers are holding hands and the Christians are punching each other in the face. What is wrong? So if you want to be spiritual, guess what? Starts with love. Amen. Not knowledge, not standards, not I'm a wicked man because my wife's got a pair of slacks on and, and I'm a holy man because my wife's in denim and has a little house on the prairie bonnet on. Give me a verse. Well, you know, a woman is not to wear that which pertaineth to a man, and a man is not to me. Right. So when my wife puts on a pair of my jeans, I'm going to have a problem with her. <laughs> what does it have to do with the bonnet? Well, that's 1 Corinthians. No, we have no such custom not in the church of God. Read the whole chapter. Oh, well, that's not what I think it means. Of course, and that's now what you're preaching, what you think. So with this... Thus ends our series within a series on the fruit of the Spirit. Nine characteristics we have studied. That's what makes you spiritual. So if you're going to start getting before the Lord and talking about some things with Him that He can help you with, here's a good place to start. And then how about flipping over 2 Peter chapter 1 about the things that He says to add to your faith. How about we start thinking on some lovely things, Philippians 4 and verse 8. Instead of just adding standards, adding practices, getting mad when other people don't keep them, have it to thyself before God. All right? And, and let's, in this New Year, so we've got the whole New Year ahead of us, now let's start praying about these things. Let's start praying. You want to worry about sins of somebody? Pray about yours. Amen. Amen. And if you want some help, come see me. And hopefully, if you be so kind. If I need some help, can I come see you? Because your pastor doesn't, he doesn't have a market on sinlessness. Jesus has the market on that. That's right. Amen. So may we all burn hot, but not so hot as to cause others to retreat from our heat. And uh, may we not freeze so cold that others withdraw the right hand of fellowship because to touch us is it's too cold, bitter, mean. Let's not be either of that. Let's not be lukewarm either, because the Lord gets sick over that. Let's burn hot, but let's be in control. Let's be temperate in all things. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, not yours. Amen? All right. Uh, Father, thank you uh, for uh, uh, wrapping this thing up for us on uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Pray now, Lord, over the next few weeks as we cover... Uh, the conclusion of the book of Galatians and in particular the spiritual warfare 
uh, that will, uh, 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 or not spiritual warfare, Lord, the, the flesh that we uh, battle with in the sixth chapter, Lord, um, and uh, that which is to come. Help us to understand everything, Lord, and get it, um, uh, I guess, get it under control. Teach us. Over these last few weeks as we wrap up Galatians, I uh, pray that you'd be with us tonight as we cover Revelation 19 and a few verses there, two or three verses uh, regarding the return of Jesus Christ to this earth just at the Battle of Armageddon, Lord, and what an exciting uh, chapter that is. I just pray that you'd bring the people out here tonight uh, and uh, encouraged and ready to hear from you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.